All right, everybody. Let me uh, start with a bit of a confession on a personal level. I'm a bit nervous <laughs> about what I'm about to share with you. Um, and the reason why I'm nervous is because I'm I'm a Calvary Chapel pastor. Many of you know this about me, and I love Calvary chapels. And I have a personal sense of indebtedness to Pastor Chuck Smith. I think he's had a wonderful impact in my life. And I mean, like, here's me. My uh, graduation from the uh, Calvary Chapel School of Ministry. There's Pastor Chuck's signature right there. Like, I'm a Calvary guy, which is a term that Calvary guys will know. And um, all that to say, while I'm deeply grateful for Pastor Chuck Smith, he did predict that Jesus would return in 1981. Like, that really happened. And I'm sorry, that Jesus would come for his church in 1981. The rapture would happen in 1981. And that in 1988, there would be the second coming. And so there was a seven-year tribulation there. And he predicted it a number of times. Also, this issue was based on scripture being taken out of context. And that same scripture is still being taken out of context regularly inside my own circle of Calvary chapels. So can I say this to start off with? If you're my brother or sister in Calvary chapels... Please hear me out here. This is not a, this is not like an attack piece on Pastor Chuck. I love and respect him. I don't consider him a false prophet. I'll explain that later. How could he get this wrong? And I'm not going to call him a false prophet. Um, I'll explain that as we go. I think it's a mistake we need to learn from and that we should face and that Calvary chapels in general uh, have just kind of turned a blind eye to it. Now, the truth is that I think most Calvary leaders aren't really aware of it. Like they're thinking, Mike, that's not even true. Where'd you hear this from? Did you get this from some blog of angry people on the internet? Uh, no, this comes from Chuck, Chuck Smith's own books and written material and his audio sermons, and I'm going to share that stuff with you today. But this is part of our verse-by-verse -verse study through the Gospel of Mark. We're in Mark 13 today, and this is the passage that, that gets taken out of context. This is the passage about the fig tree, and when the fig tree is sprouting, and then you have one generation, and so then all this calculation started going on, and it was a misunderstanding of prophecy, and one that was propagated for many, many years after 1981. So, yes... Um, I don't want to be divisive here. I, again, I deeply appreciate Pastor Chuck Smith. He's the founder of the Calvary Chapel movement. If you guys aren't sure, aren't, aren't familiar with who he is, I think there's over 2,000 Calvary chapels now. There was one in the in the 60s, and that was where Pastor Chuck was teaching. And he was a very gifted teacher, uh, very uh, moving evangelist, even though you'd think of him as a teacher. He's a very moving and effective evangelist. Many people came to Christ. It was part of the whole Jesus culture, Jesus movement that was going on in the 60s and 70s. I'm not talking about the band nowadays. I'm talking about what was happening back then. And it was a massive revival. And Calvary Chapel was in, at the heart of it. We weren't the only group that had revival going on. It was massive. It was worldwide. But Calvary Chapel was, was definitely in the midst of it all. And uh, it was a beautiful, wonderful thing. And in the midst of it, some mistakes were made. This was a pretty significant one. Now, I first heard these things in Chuck tapes um, where Pastor Chuck, I was listening to, am I, am I going through the school of ministry at Calvary Costa Mesa, where Pastor Chuck was one of my teachers that would come in weekly and teach us. Um, when I was there back in uh, 2004 to 2006, I heard him give this statement in his old studies. We would listen to Chuck tapes. We're listening to Pastor Chuck teaching from the from 1979 to 85 right we listened to these this chuck series seven years of sunday night messages and we heard all of them and in, in them he actually is talking about the rapture and he says that it, that the world can't last for another 20 years and he's convinced of it and i'm like it's 2005 probably when i was listening to this and i'm like that doesn't really work you know what what's going on and what was weird was nobody ever said anything about it well i didn't make a huge deal about it right because i wasn't sure that it had ever been said again. I didn't know if Chuck had ever repeated this, if Pastor Chuck had mentioned this again at other times. What I didn't know at the time was that not only had he repeated it, he had written it in multiple books. Um, so, for example, in the book um, In Times, which I have a copy of, where I was, oh, here it is, I was just holding. In the, in the book In Times, I have a copy of it. No, I did not pay $350 on Amazon to get it. You, if you see crazy expensive books on Amazon, go somewhere else, guys. There are other ways, other ways to find books. And I did get a copy of it. Or then there is the book Snatched Away, which doesn't have a preview here on Amazon, but it's a thousand bucks because these books are rare. They don't publish them anymore. The content of them has kind of been somewhat hidden. I'm going to read you quotes from the material. I wanted to make sure that Pastor Chuck had really said these things and really said them in unequivocal ways. And I'm going to talk about those issues today. We've got to learn from it. See, here's here's my all my cards on the table. To my brothers and sisters in Calvary Chapels, my pastor friends in Calvary Chapels, we have been reckless with prophecy. We inherited this recklessness from Pastor Chuck. Right? He, he didn't predict the rapture again after he did it this one time. Thank God. But 
the recklessness, the kind of over projecting our opinions onto scripture never stopped, in my opinion. It, it largely never stopped. And so this can serve as a corrective, something we can learn from and we can deal with it. Plus, um, and I'm going to tell you some of the reasons why I'm doing this, right? Um, I have been asked by a number of people about, because I'm a Calvary pastor and they watch my stuff online. Oops, <laughs> everything's falling apart. And they watch things online that I do and then they go to Calvary chapels in their local area. They're like, well, Mike's a Calvary guy. I like his teaching. So there are people attending Calvary's all over the place in some cases because of the influence I've had in their lives. So when they hear about the founder of Calvary having predicted the rapture happening in 81 and no one in Calvary ever talks about it, they send messages to us, right? Through the website, they're like, oh, hey, what's up with this? Did that happen? This caused me to look into it more deeply and find out that it was written in printed books, that it was not just a, hey, wouldn't it be cool? It was a prediction. It was like an actual prediction, but it wasn't a prophecy. And I'll explain the difference later. We're going to get into all this stuff in detail. But first, let's just look at the text. This is the passage of scripture because this is all just part of my verse by verse teaching through the gospel of Mark. I wouldn't deal with this if it wasn't just what we happen to be dealing with right now, going verse by verse through the gospel of Mark. Here we are, Mark 13. This is the passage that gets interpreted wrong very often by people in my own community, Calvary Chapel. Um, it says, now learn the parable from the fig tree, Jesus says. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. Even so, you too, when you see these things happening, recognize that he is near right at the door. Truly, I say to you, this, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So how did Pastor Chuck interpret these words. Let me share with you some quotes specifically from his book, In Times. These are quotes I'm reading directly from the book. I've just written them on my notes here. He says in the introduction, and I'm going to read more than just the quotes where he predicts it, because here's what I want us to understand. Um, did he really predict it? What, what was the error there? How can we learn from it? And how can Calvary be honest about this issue, um, which we need to be? And and part of that is to realize that he wasn't. it wasn't as bad as some people make it out to be. And it, and it was a lot worse than some other people make it out to be. So here's the whole balanced understanding of this issue. In the introduction to End Times, Pastor Chuck wrote, Before we begin to look at the situation, let me emphasize one point. I have no intention of telling you the day that the Lord is coming for his church, the rapture. I, that's, I'm adding the rapture. When, when Pastor Chuck used the phrase coming for his church, he meant rapture. I do not know the day. Nobody knows that day or hour. Now, that is like, see, Pastor, some people are going to already, like, see, Pastor Chuck didn't predict the rapture. He says no one knows the day or hour. But it seems to me that Pastor Chuck and, and some others in Calvary as well, they think that no one knows the day or hour means you don't know the calendar date and the time of day. But I think the way this term is used in scripture is to say no one knows when this will happen at all. Like, if you don't know the day, you don't know the hour, you don't know the year, you don't know the decade, you just don't know. Like that would be how it's used. So Pastor Chuck felt like he wasn't making a prediction because he didn't put a calendar date on it. He only gave a year. So he thought he was dodging that issue that way. Or so it seems to me. Let me read on. On page 35 of In Times, he wrote this. If I understand scripture correctly, Jesus taught us that the generation which sees the budding of the fig tree, that's that verse I just read, when you see the budding of the fig tree, one generation. He says, the generation which sees the budding of the fig tree, the birth of the nation of Israel, will be the generation that sees the Lord's return. I believe that generation of 1948 is the last generation. Since a generation of judgment is 40 years and the tribulation period lasts seven years, I believe the Lord could come back for his church any time before the tribulation starts, which would mean any time before 1981. So he anticipated uh, really a 1980 return, but 1981 is the date that, that got through around a lot in regards to this. So then he has a little math section. He goes 1948 plus 40 minus 7, the tribulation, equals 1981, being a pre-trib rapture position. Boom, that's when it's going to happen. So he's convinced. Now, he does he say it's prophecy? Does he say God spoke to him? No. But he thinks, he thinks he's got the math right. His interpretation of scripture is right here. But I'm going to say it's obviously wrong. Obviously wrong. We'll get into the details here uh, in a minute. Whereas I would agree with most of what Pastor Chuck teaches and appreciate it and, and, and say that you guys should, you could check out his sermons and look at his books and stuff like that. This is, I would suggest, is obviously wrong. He also offered a second possible date. He said, however, it's possible. This is reading on from page 35. It's possible that, that Jesus is dating the beginning of the... <clears throat> 
At the end of the book, towards the end, page 83, it's a pretty short book. He says, the church ought to be looking up, expecting and looking for our Lord. We should be proclaiming to the world the end of the world. And this was what he did in his sermons over and over again. He's like, hey, it's happening anytime now, anytime now. Now, let me read from Future Survival. This is a book also printed in 1978. And this is Pastor Chuck. He wrote this, page 20. says, from my understanding of biblical prophecies, I'm convinced that the Lord is coming for his church before the end of 1981. Now, just before it was before 1981. Now he says before the end of 1981. Um, he says then, I could be wrong. Is that important? Yes, that's important. He says, I could be wrong. But it's a deep conviction in my heart and all my plans are predicated on that belief. Okay, so he admitted he could be wrong. This isn't prophecy. This is him going, I think I've interpreted scripture right. And if I'm right, rapture's coming. And so I'm planning on it. I'm preparing for it. So that that's, that's a big deal. Because it, all it means then is if you're wrong about this, then there's something significantly wrong with your your ability to, or your functional application of interpreting the Bible when it comes to this very passage. And that's what I'm saying. I'm saying, it, and it should have been obvious. Like this should, this should not have, the fig tree thing is, you'll see in a minute. <laughs> when I get there, this is not to be interpreted the way that it has historically been interpreted, not just by Calvary Chapel, but by um, like a, a, a significant number of people. And still today is just... It's obviously wrong. On page 21, he says of the future survival, he says, the Lord said towards the end of that period of the tribulation period, the sun would scorch men who dwell upon the face of the earth. Revelation 16, the year 1986 would fit just about right. Pastor Chuck said, so he was looking at like news reports and scientific guessing about global warming at the time. And he was thinking for those who aren't very, you are, you're pretty young. You don't maybe know this, the, the doom and gloom about climate change has been going on for quite a while now. And I'm, I'm, no, I'm not interested in whether they're right or wrong at any point about this. The, the issue is he was, he was looking to scientists saying, yeah, there's going to be crazy global warming in, in, in soon years. And he goes, ah, that's revelation. So he, he was looking at current events and guessing at how they might fulfill prophecy. This to me is a reckless business and it creates embarrassment in otherwise wonderful people of God. Let me read on. This is from page 49 in Future Survival. He says, from a a biblical standpoint, one of the reasons I believe that man has come to the end of his time is the rebirth of the nation Israel. It's an event that was predicted by most of the Bible prophets and by Jesus Christ himself. Sort of, yes. It's required by the predictions of, of a lot of places in scripture. That's true. I'd agree with that. As he gave the signs of the last days, he told his disciples that when the fig tree began to bud forth, they would know that summer was nigh. Even know, he said, my coming is at the door. Then Jesus said that the generation would not pass until all these things be fulfilled. Matthew 24. So the rebirth of the nation Israel marks the final generation upon of man upon the earth in this present order. Do you catch the idea? He thought the fig tree budding is, re, is Israel becoming a nation again. And I'm saying that is not supported by scripture at all. And it led to a reckless attitude towards prophecy that became a very embarrassing moment as these books were pulled, probably, I mean, it seems as though they were pulled from publishing. They're very hard to find even now. And then it just wasn't talked about. It wasn't talked about. Sadly, this is one reason why I'm doing this. Sadly, um, years later, when Pastor Chuck was asked about this in a Pastor's Perspective program on on uh, K-Wave, which if you're a Calvary person, you know what I'm talking about. If you're not, you're like, what are you talking about? Well, every every day of the week, every weekday, he would do an hour-long Q&A discussion thing where he would offer a pastor's perspective, taking radio calls. One of the calls asked him about this prediction, which clearly happened. There's clearly a prediction, right? He doesn't say it's prophecy, but he's saying, I think this is going to happen. And I think the answer was misleading. And I think we need to deal with this straight in a straightforward way. So listen in. This is how that discussion went. There's another thing real fast, and that is uh, uh, my office made it pointed out at some point there was a prediction of Christ's return uh, via Calvary Chapel. Is, is that is that real some years ago? Is that Did that happen? No, uh, never. We all, we do believe he's going to return soon. And, uh, but ne- oh, but never you. any date. Got it. No, no, no. Never any date because no man knows the day or the hour. Right. I believe he's going to come this next year, but <laughs> you know. okay. So the thing about this is, um, Pastor Chuck did set a date, 
Now, I think in his head, I'm just going to guess here, in his head, he's thinking, I didn't give a day an hour. I didn't say December 15th at 4 p.m. So he didn't give a day and an hour. So he, he's going to like try to spin, spin that into there was no prediction. But in reality, there was. Now, there was a huge shift. After this happened in the 80, in 1981, um, I don't think it ever happened again. Ever. And this is unlike every other guy who's predicted things, right? Where he goes, prophecy, they all start just, they just do it again and again. Harold Camping over and over and over again, right? Um, uh, the, the JW organization over and over again. Um, so he never did it again. And after that, he did, he did berate people for trying to set a date. And he says, it's foolish. It's utterly foolish. But he wouldn't openly acknowledge that he had done it himself. At one point, he said, like, I came close to setting a date. And I'm like, dude, you set a date. Like, that's what this book, that's why you don't publish the book anymore. You know, you set the date. And it's embarrassing. Now, I want to balance this out a bit. And I want to say this. He also says on page 35 of Future Survival, he says, I should not quit my job. I should not borrow as much long-term money as possible. The Lord told us to occupy till he comes. That's significant. Again, after in, on page 36, after predicting 1981 as the likely year for the rapture, he says, be diligent about the things of the Lord and yet practical about your life. Don't quit your job. Don't quit school. But all the while, look up and lift up your head for your redemption's drawing nigh. Now, if you listen to sermons, uh, to, well, if you go online, you'll, you'll see blogs that act like what was going on at Calvary was like, like they were all gathered together waiting for the moment when they would be taken up. Um, but when you actually listen to the messages that Pastor Chuck was giving at the end of 1981, I don't hear that in the messages. Like his Christmas message that year was on Isaiah 9-6, and he says nothing about how like, seven more days, guys, and we're out of here. That's not there at all. Um, and then shortly thereafter, his next message, which seems to have been right after the new year in 1982, right at the beginning of the new year, right in 1982, his next message, which is called um, How Long... Oh, it's called something. How long something? How long will the world go on? How long till the end comes? Something like that. Um, and he was talking about Daniel 12. And in that message, he's very much the Chuck that we all knew, right? Where he's like, guys, he could come at any time. We need to be ready for him. And that is, there's nothing wrong with those messages. But he doesn't say anything about the prediction that had previously happened. So I think he learned his lesson silently, but he didn't deal with it publicly. Um, my conclusions are this, as we then go into, we're gonna go to the verse by verse thing and I'll show you why I think this was wrong and obviously wrong. You don't need a degree in anything to see the problems with this. We'll talk about those issues in a second. And the lessons we can learn from it because the recklessness in prophecy is one of my pet peeves that goes on for other people like me who are pre-millennial, like you believe that the millennium is coming, you believe that the return of Christ is going to be ushering in this stuff and there's going to, you know, I'm looking at a tribulation period, like I think that's all future. Um, but man, my my those who agree with me are often people I'm like, man, I just I just wish you were like post or post a millennial or something just so you'd stop. You know? <laughs> and sometimes that's the case. Um, so Conclusions about Pastor Chuck before we go to the verse by verse stuff and explain the passage and we learn our lessons. Um, he did not offer spiritual prophecy. He did not say the Lord told me this. I've re I've been revealed. This has been revealed to me by the Spirit. He even in the middle of it, even when he's this is a sense of humility. Even even when he thought he was right, he was like, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. I respect that, and I'm not going to ignore that. That was a good thing. Um, he said he was convinced. He didn't say it's undeniably true though, and that's a, that's another positive thing. The the reason, this is probably why I would say, like, say the Watchtower organization, when they predict the end, um, that was different. Uh, Harold Camping, when he predicts the end, that's different, right? Harold Camping told people to sell their homes. He took their money. He used it to buy billboards for all over the world to falsely predict the rapture. Um, what I what I forgot was, at the time, my own church, there was a billboard down the street when, in, when Harold Camping did his thing, and he put up, you know, the rapture's coming, and he gave a, literally gave a day. It was, on, it was on the billboard. You have till this day to get saved. And our church had up on our marquee um, that that date, March, whatever it was, 25th or something, is not the rapture. <laughs> because we're like, we just wanted to like separate ourselves from that. Because that has been the Calvary I've known. The Calvary I've known my whole life has been the Calvary that would never set a date and never be predicting those things. Would be sometimes a bit loosey-goosey with interpreting prophecy, to be completely honest. Um, but not setting dates like that. Um, so yes, Pastor Chuck's stuff though was full of issues. It was full of problems. Um, but he never said like the Watchtower organization, he never said that he was speaking for God, right? The Watchtower said, we're just doing calculations based on scripture. But in addition to that, they claimed that the governing body is God's voice on the earth, 
Okay, so they're claiming to be in, an, in a prophetic office doing inspired interpretation of scripture. Okay, so then that's the category of false prophecy. This is the category of reckless misinterpretation of scripture. It's still significant. It's not the same. I don't think we need to invalidate his books and throw out his, his ministry. Um, uh, and if I thought so, I would tell you. If you're thinking, Mike, you're just defending him because you're because you're a Calvary and you don't want to upset people. Oh, if that was how I felt, I wouldn't make this video at all. <laughs> if that was the truth. I'm hoping I don't lose any friends over this, but it's entirely possible, sadly. Um, as far as I know, this was never, ever addressed. The only time I hear it addressed is in that those moments when people say, did you predict the end? And then he goes, no, no, we never set a date. We never set a date, which to me sounds like denial. And that's misleading, in my opinion. So we've got to get to the bottom of this. What is going on with Mark 13, 28, 29? What's the fig tree? Is that Israel? Are we supposed to be counting a generation? And we're going to answer those questions now. And then I'll talk about how we can apply all this. So we can do better. So we can do better. God willing. Mark 13, 28. Now learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So it's a time indicator about summer coming. Even so, you too, when you see these things happening, recognize that he is near right at the door. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. This passage, again, used by not just Pastor Chuck Smith, massive numbers of people. He did this as well, and he's founding person for Calvary Chapels. And I, th I feel a sense of obligation to deal with this because of that. And because I'm leading people to Calvary Chapels with my ministry, which I think is a good thing, by the way, I would, if I moved into a new area, I would consider looking at a Calvary Chapel. And because I think the the emphasis on scripture, on the word of God and the verse by verse teaching, um, the balance about uh, unity in essentials and, and, and grace and uh, I'm sorry, uh, I forget the phrase. <laughs> anyway, the phrase is something like, Yes, well, we, we're committed to the essentials of the faith, but on the secondary issues, we try to just have unity with other believers. The fact that they do that among Calvary's is great as well. All those things are fantastic. Um, I'm a big fan of Calvary, even even if Calvary Chapel is not going to be a big fan of me pretty soon. Here. <laughs> we'll see. Hopefully that, that doesn't change. Um, but they use this to date the return of Christ. So 1948, Israel becomes a nation. Hey, that's the budding of the fig tree. Wrong prop, Wrong interpretation there. And then... You go to 1988, second coming, back up seven years, 1981. Other people said, oh, no, no, it's when Israel controls Jerusalem. So you have 1967 as the starting date because then there was this whole war and they took over Jerusalem. Okay, so then you go to 2007 for the second coming, um, 2000 for the rapture. And all of that was just, it's all bunk. It's all bunk. So we're going to answer the three questions right now. What is the fig tree? What is it supposed to represent? And it's not that hard, but we're going to need to detail. Um, what is the generation and when is the generation? Because those are two different issues. There's debates on what is meant by generation. Some think it doesn't mean a, a group of people alive during a certain time. And then we'll talk about when this generation is. Because the preterists would say it happened in 70 AD. There are Jesus's contemporaries. And I'm going to build a case that it's a future generation. And we'll talk about that. So what is the fig tree? The first thing you'll hear, if you go Google it right now, you could actually Google it right now like, What's the fig tree in the Bible represent? You're going to get a website that tells you it represents Israel. Fig trees represent Israel. And this is stuff that I was taught as well over the years. And yet, if you try to really substantiate it, you find out the biblical case for that is extremely weak. Fig trees do not, by default, represent Israel. That's not scriptural. And if you, if, for anybody who's getting hot under the collar, I'm going to walk through scriptures right now with you. Our commitments to the word of God not to a teaching that we've had and held to over time. Our commitment is to scripture. We got to go with what it says. And this does involve changing your mind. Um, certainly I've had to change my mind over the years on different things. So here are some verses in the Bible that mention fig trees. And one of them is Judges 9 verses 10 through 11. This is the first occurrence of a fig tree, the term fig tree in the Bible. And the fig tree here in other and other fruit bearing plants, they represent good descendants of Gideon, one of the judges of Israel, who refused to be king of Israel. And then Bramble represents Abimelech. Of course, all of these are descendants of Abraham. So here you have one person representing a fig tree who's a good descendant of, of, of Gideon who refuses to be king, and then another descendant of Gideon who's the bramble. So is that representing Israel? No, that does not represent Israel. It's the first use. The second use is in 1 Kings 4.25, where a man is, quote, sitting under his fig tree or his vine. And that is a commonly used picture in the Old Testament. Sitting under your fig and your vine is a 
a picture of prosperity and good times. Okay, so this is kind of like um, in America, the idea like uh, everyone, you know, you've got your uh, you got your car and your lawn. <laughs> And I know that may sound weird. It's like you're you're sipping tea and you got your car and your lawn. And that would be a picture of like peace and and doing well, prosperity. And so sitting under a fig tree and a vine is a picture of prosperity because these are fruit bearing plants and you have your own fig tree. So you're doing well because you've got your own provision. You're enjoying the fruit of the land. It, it doesn't picture Israel though. It just means prosperity. Um, the fig tree and the vine are used to represent um, prosperity in other non-Jewish nations, non israel Israel nations as well. The third use is Proverbs 27, 18. It does not represent the fig tree here, or the fig tree does not represent Israel here either. The fig tree here represents a man's master. Just like if you take care of a fig tree, you eat of its fruit. If a man takes care of his master, or you could, the most closest modern connection here is employer. If you take care of your employer, then you eat of the fruit of their prosperity, right? So there's a relationship, at least if it's a good employer, like Taco Bell doesn't do this for you. That was my first job. In and Out does that for you. That was my second job. There's a there's a good employer. Um, then you've got the Song of Songs or Song of Solomon, and this is chapter two, verse thirteen. The next occurrence of the fig tree chronologically, as we go, the phrase fig tree occurs then fourth time in Song of Songs. The fig tree here it puts out its green figs, and that symbolizes that the time for love has arrived. It's a seasonal signal that the time for love has arrived and the, 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 the two lovers in Song of Songs are going to be able to like be together now. And so I'll read it to you. Song of Solomon 2.13. I'm reading this one to you because I'll actually I'll put it up on your screen. Because this one is closest to Jesus' use. Because it doesn't just mention a fig tree. It mentions the budding and the blossoming of the fig tree. So let's read it here. The fig tree has ripened its figs and the vines in blossom have given forth their fragrance. Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, and come along. He's like saying, it's finally time for us to be together. Like, like our time has come. It's a, it's a delight, delightful moment. It's a time indicator. And that's, of course, Jesus' emphasis. Spoiler alert. So we, I've given you four examples, the four uses chronologically of fig tree, and they don't represent Israel a single time. The fifth one is Isaiah 34.4. The fig tree here represents global catastrophe. Global catastrophe. It doesn't represent Israel, to my knowledge. The sixth example is Hosea 9.10. Here, the fathers of Israel are likened to grapes in the wilderness or the first fruits on a fig tree. Notice how vines and fig trees are always coupled together. This is a normal thing. It's not just with Israel. Vines and fig trees are coupled together because they symbolize the, 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 in the farming community that they've got. These are two things that symbolize prosperity. Well, God says to them, okay, your fathers, they were like vine, like uh, figs, first fruits on a fig tree. Okay, so th there's a connection there. I mean, it doesn't say Israel is a fig tree, but but it, there's like a connection. So yes-ish. Hosea 9.10, yes-ish. There's a fig tree connection sort of to Israel. Joel 1.7 has a stronger connection and it has probably the strongest connection. In Joel 1.7, the fig tree seems to be a picture of Israel as a whole, but... Later on in Joel, the references show that literal figs being destroyed in Israel are what's in view here. Like God's actually going to destroy their fig trees in Israel. So it's it's not super strong. It's there, but it's not super strong. There's another passage in Jeremiah that mentions a basket of figs and some are good and some are bad. That doesn't make Israel a fig tree. That's Yet that's what's quoted. Finally, we have an eighth passage. And that's in Nahum 3.12. Fig trees here are strongholds in Israel and the, the Fig tree is being used as a symbol of like a fort right, or a stronghold in Israel and it's being shaken and the fig trees fall. And that's what the picture of you shaking a fig tree and the, and the ripe fruit falling, that's going to be the enemies of Israel coming to the strongholds and it'll be like they just take what they want from you. And it doesn't represent Israel uniquely there. Do you get the idea? The premise of the 1948-1988 connection is that fig trees represent Israel, but they don't. And I can make this more clear. And this is why I say it's obvious. Look at Luke 21 with me. One of the things you basically do when you're teaching is you do cross-references. Then he told them a parable. Behold the fig tree and all the trees. Wait a minute. This isn't about the fig tree uniquely? All the trees? Yeah, this is not. Jesus, it's not. The issue isn't that it's a fig tree. The figginess of the tree is not... 
is not the thing. I just thought of the figgy pudding in my head all of a sudden. But um, yeah, the figginess of the tree is not the thing that establishes what Jesus is talking about. When he's like, what you're going to look for, it's not about it being figgy. It's about the timing. As soon as they put forth leaves, you see it and know for yourselves that summer is now near. It, the issue is timing. You know how trees blossom around summertime. That's the point. It's not, it's not so much about it being a fig. So conclusions, right? The fig tree, you could use it to represent Israel, but it's not to be assumed. It doesn't automatically represent that. Fig trees are used metaphorically in a huge variety of ways in the Bible. The closest comparison to Jesus's use is Song of Solomon, where it's just a time indicator about a season arriving. And that's how Jesus uses it in the Olivet Discourse. And it's just a deciduous tree, a, a tree that blossoms in spring, as opposed to some other trees in Israel that would have blossomed at different times of the year. Jesus wants to use one that blossoms in the spring. That was kind of a lot to go through to simply say this. It should be pretty obvious. This is not representing Israel, the fig tree. And if I go back to Mark 13 and we look at it more carefully, we're going to see this, that what Jesus is giving you is, okay, there's a parable of the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. Here's a wind and you know. There's a something you see and then something you know. You see the branch and the leaves and all that. And now you know summer is near. Even so, you too, when you see these things, whatever those things are, happen, recognize he is near. Okay, so the second coming is near when you see these things. What are the these things? Well, that is seen earlier in Mark. It's going to be the uh, the abomination of desolation. I went, I've gone through this in the past couple of weeks. The abomination of desolation and then cosmic signs. Now, let me read through with you because I just want us, above all else, to know what scripture says and to prioritize that. One way to test my interpretation is we read the scripture with all that in view. What are, what's the sign Jesus gives? Gives. Well, let's look at it again carefully. And I'm going to give a summary now of all of Mark 13 that we've gone through as we're coming kind of to the close of our prophetic stuff in the Gospel of Mark. Next week will be the very end of it. But here we go. Mark 13, 1. As he was going out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, behold, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, do you not see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. And as so he's talking about the destruction of the temple. And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew were questioning him privately. Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are going to be fulfilled? We learned from the other gospels that they also asked him about when the end is coming and when his, re his return is going to be, his second coming is going to happen. And in Mark, this phrase, when all these things are going to be fulfilled is probably a, a phrase that was to trigger the idea of they're talking about all of prophecy, not just the second coming uh, or the, uh, the destruction of the temple. They want to know about all of prophecy. Uh, number verse five, and Jesus began to say to them, see to it that no one misleads you. No one misleads you. Many will come in my name saying, I'm he and will mislead many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be frightened. Yet uh, even Pastor Chuck, a lot of his teaching was wars and rumors of wars. People should get scared because this means the end's coming. He saw all these as signs. But according to Jesus, these are not. That's a mistake we don't want to repeat. Those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will also be famines. These things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. And I went over this in previous weeks. Birth pangs doesn't mean it's coming soon. Birth pangs means these are the pains that, that lead to something, not the thing. That's how it's used. Look at Romans 8. That's how birth pangs are used. It's all of creation has been in birth pangs for a very long time now. It's not a time indicator. It's a, it's just saying that what you're going through now is leading to something else. But be on your guard. Uh, excuse me. So let me say so far, we've got things that are not signs. Claims that Jesus has come back. These are not signs. You can ignore all claims that Jesus has already come back. That someone's like, I'm Jesus. I'm him. I'm, he's back. I'm reincarnated. Ignore every one of these. They're all a cult. Um, easy. Wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes, famines. Matthew adds pestilence. These things are not signs. They're not signs. So calm down. Let's not over project into current events, things that aren't even supposed to be signs as if they are signs. This is a habit I've seen so much in churches um, and among pastors, and I don't think it's responsible. We've inherited it from people we, we thought were doing good. But if we, look at their, if we look at their actual track record, we realize they kept getting it wrong. Can we not do that? 
Verse 9 says, Be on your guard, for they will deliver you to the courts, and you will be flogged in the synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them. The gospel must first be preached to all the nations. Some take verse 10 as a statement that as soon as the gospel gets to the last nation, that's when the rapture happens, or that's when the second coming happens, whether you're pre or mid or post-trib, I don't even care. All right? And they go, that's, but that's the moment when, when it's going to end. And they're like, but verse 10 doesn't say that. It just tells us our mission. Go and preach the gospel to all the nations. But it doesn't say, as soon as the last remote tribe hears the gospel, that's when the second coming is going to start. Like, the Bible doesn't tell us that. We're assuming things on scripture because we're excited, rightly excited, about the coming of Christ, which is very much real and very much on its way. But we don't want to assume too much. In fact, this is kind of written to keep us from assuming things. When they arrest you and hand you over, don't worry beforehand about what you are to say, but... But say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but it is the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father, his children, his child, and children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. So the bottom line here is this is our mission. <clears throat> There's going to be a long delay. Everything in Mark up to verse 13 is things that don't mean the end, right? You're just going to go through trials, tribulation, suffering, you buckle down and preach the gospel of Christ. You, Christian, your biggest thing is to get the gospel out to all nations. And there's a long delay. None of those were signs up till verse 13. This is my big contention, and I'll contend with people who disagree in a loving and gracious way. But I'm going to say a lot of weird, um, unjustified end time speculation occurs because we think verses 1 through 13 are signs. When they're not signs. Verse 14, however, this is the first sign to watch, to watch for. When you see the abomination of desolation standing where it should not, where it should not be, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea uh, flee to the mountains. So the abomination of desolation I talked about in, in a, last week, I think it was, and, or was it two weeks ago? It's, it's in there. It's in the Mark series. I've got a link to the playlist down below if anybody's interested. So I talked about that. That's the sign to look for though. That's, that's the sign you can see. That's it. Everything before that is not signs. Reading on, verse 15, the one who's on the housetop must not go down or go in to get anything out of his house, and the one who's in the field must not turn back to get his coat. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. But pray that it may not happen in winter. Notice that Jesus says this. Like, This is puzzling because you're like, does that mean that the time is optional? Like, Pray that it doesn't happen in winter? Doesn't Jesus know when it's going to happen? It seems as though Jesus, and we'll get, we'll get here next week, where Jesus says, I don't know the day or the hour. It seems to me he doesn't know the day or the hour of the second coming at this point. I think he knows now, but at the point in when he says this on earth in his humility, he doesn't know the day or the hour of the second coming or the abomination of desolation. And given that there's a three and a half year period between the two, it makes sense if he doesn't know the day or the hour of the abomination of desolation either. Because if he knew one, he would know the other. So pray that it might not happen in winter could be part of the idea that he's like, I don't know when this is going to happen. Right? It's a sign to see, and then the, the clock starts ticking when the abomination of desolation starts. Boom, clock starts ticking. Before that, you, you can't be certain that you're living in that day. You just don't know. Verse 19, for those days will be a time of tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the creation, which God created until now and never will. Unless the Lord had shortened those days... Notice those days, this phrase comes up a lot here and it's important. Unless the Lord had shortened those days, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ or behold, he is there. Don't believe them. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show, show signs and wonders in order to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. We will expect even more false Christ claims to happen at this very, very end of all things. Verse 23, but take heed, behold, I've told you everything in advance. Okay, so there's one sign so far to look for. The abomination of desolation. And then there's going to be more turmoil, more troubles, and more hard times. Then there's a second sign type thing. And that's in verse 24. In those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven. Which I take to be cosmic uh, signs, like meteors and things like that. Um, that's what I think it probably is. Um, at least from the Earth's perspective, the sun is dark to us, whether it's like dark. You know, if you went out and orbited the sun, you might not see it dark, but it's going to be at least dark from our perspective. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with power and great glory. And he will send his angels forth his angels and they will gather together as elect from the four winds from the farthest end of the earth to the farthest end of heaven. 
Now, he's given two signs, the abomination of desolation and the cosmic signs. Now learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. Even so, you too, when you see these things, the abomination of desolation and the cosmic signs. When you see these things happening, recognize that he is near right at the door. This is, I think, what the fig tree means. I don't think the fig tree has anything to do with Israel becoming a nation. Even if Israel becoming a nation is required for the fulfillment of prophecy, it doesn't give us a time clock for prophecy. It's just really neat. It doesn't give us a time clock for those things if you're a premillennial person as I am. Jerusalem being under Jewish control, that seems like it should be the case for prophecy to be fulfilled. Does that mean that when I see it come under Jewish control, I start counting down days? No, that goes against what Jesus said because he gave a sign and that's not the sign. He didn't say the temple being rebuilt. You could rebuild the temple now and it could be 300 years of the temple just sitting there before all this stuff goes down. We get too excited about the signs that lead to the signs that might be the signs that could be the signs. And we'd get too excited about it we set ourselves up, not only for our personal embarrassment or disappointment, but we, we can make scripture look like it's not reliable because our interpretation was not careful. That is a great tragedy. But that comes from tradition, not scripture. And this fig tree stuff doesn't come from scripture. It's a tradition thing that we, we need to notice it. And if I still have any friends, I will continue on with the study. Verse 30, <laughs> verse 30, which says right here, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth may pass away. will pass away, but my words will not pass away. What is this generation? That's the question we're going to ask now. <clears throat> I've told you what the fig tree I think is. I think the context is super clear. Luke clinches it. The fig tree doesn't represent Israel because he's like, and all the trees. Okay. You, what if, if fig tree is Israel and all the trees are going to bud at the same time, that's like saying every nation becoming a nation. All of a sudden, it just doesn't make any sense. No, the signs are the abomination, desolation, cosmic signs. But what is the generation? Now, here are some possible meanings. Um, some people say that Jesus was predicting this generation will not pass away, but he was using the Greek word genea in a very different fashion than what you're thinking. You're thinking of a generation like the millennial generation, Gen Z. You're thinking of these types of terms. But really what, what they meant was a race of people or like an ethnic group or a um, or a cluster of people that are organized by some sort of idea they all agree with. They have some kind of identity, shared identity. So this was Jerome's interpretation of this. Jerome in the 4th century, the guy that translated the Latin Vulgate, right, which was like the Bible of the Catholic Church. Well, it kind of still is, I mean, officially, based on the Council of Trent. Um, so the um, th this Ganea, this idea of it being a, a group, a, a clan, a race, or a kind of people, uh, that could work. This would mean that Jesus is saying, Maybe the Jewish people are the Ganea. This generation, the Jewish people, they will not pass away. So even though they'll be persecuted, like the Holocaust, like they won't actually be eradicated. God will preserve them. That would be a possible interpretation. Um, or it's the Christians. The Ganea is those who are following Christ. The Christians, they will not pass away, right? The gates of, of Hades will not prevail against us. So Christians will continue to persevere and spread the gospel even in the midst of persecution. It could mean that. Or it could be Ganea, could be wicked people. Some people do interpret it that way. They go, well, generations usually used in a negative context. By the way, I'm summarizing like eight hours of research here in like two minutes. So give me a little leeway. <laughs> um, but um, it's more than eight hours, actually. So it could mean wicked people. Ganea is typically used in a negative connotation in scripture. Usually Jesus is like this wicked generation, this you know bad generation of people. Um, but the word Ganea doesn't actually mean wicked. It's just it's often used in that fashion. But you get, here's the problem with this view is that if you interpret Ganea as meaning a kind of people, it's hard to even know what kind of people it's talking about because there's nothing in the context that helps you know what the Ganea is. So that's a bit of a challenge. So most people will take this, the vast, vast, vast majority of people are going to take this, um, probably a consensus, I imagine, of scholars. We're going to take this to say the Ganea means a specific like time period, like 40 years 70 years, 100 years, there's a generation of people that is represented here, right? 40, the year of judgment we read about in scripture, uh, generation of judgment, yeah, 40 years in the wilderness and they all die. Or 70, Proverbs says that the days of a man's life are 70 years or by reason of strength, 80. So maybe it's 70, possibly 80 years. Or some would say 100 years. Abraham was 100 when he had uh, his son. Or some would say 120 years because in Genesis, we read about man's days shall be 120 years. 
So maybe a generation is 120 years. Uh, uh, my interpretation is going to say it doesn't matter. <laughs> this is going to be real easy for you. It doesn't matter. Forget about it. It's not going to last until the end of the 40, 70, 120, right? It's going to be within all that time and quite a lot within. I'll explain in a moment. So what's the generation probably talking about a local like time period of people, right? Much less than 40 years. We'll get there in a minute. Um, but the, ter the term generally does mean this. It generally means contemporaries um, and often in a negative sense. And now here's where I'm going to disagree with the majority of scholars. Okay. Alert. <laughs> Alert, everybody. I'm just agreeing with the majority of scholars. Believe it or not, you disagree with the majority of scholars in lots of ways and places in your life, and I approve, right? You should disagree with the majority of scholars whenever you have reasons to disagree with the majority of scholars. It's that simple. You feel like you have good reasons, you should go with it. And I would imagine uh, th that the majority of scholars would agree that you shouldn't just follow the majority of scholars blindly, which would create an interesting paradox for those who do think you should follow the majority of scholars all the time. But let me tell you, the majority of scholars would say that Jesus was talking about his generation. When he says this generation will not pass away, he meant everything he said in Mark 13 had to happen within 40 years of Jesus saying it. So we're looking at Jesus around 30 AD and then the temple destruction at 70 AD. Hence, this is one of the arguments for preterism, the idea that all of that stuff was fulfilled. Um, I am thoroughly disagree with that perspective graciously, like I did a whole thing, if you haven't seen it, on six different end times views. I talked graciously about preterism. I talked about some of the weaknesses as well. But I think that that's not the case. Um, it's true. <clears throat> um, now I'll give you how they build their case. Mark 8, 12. When is the generation of Jesus? Here's how they build their case, those who disagree with me. They're going to say the term generally means contemporaries. Let's look at some examples. Mark 8, 12. Sighing deeply in his spirit, he says, why does this generation seek for a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. Here, Jesus is obviously talking about the people in his own time. These are his contemporaries. So there's one example. I can give you another one. This is Mark, also Mark. Notice we're in the same book, Mark 8, 38. Whoever's ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, right? The son of man will also be ashamed when he comes. So this is a current generation. He's talking about the people that are alive while he's talking. And then Mark 9, 19, again, Oh, unbelieving generation, how long will I be with you? He's talking about, obviously he's with them right then. He's talking about the contemporary generation. He's he's talking about them right there. This seems pretty clear in the passage. So the majority of scholars are going to say, hey, you know, 70 AD. This is, this is Mark 13, Matthew 24, Luke 21, the parallel passages. They all refer to 70 AD. Now, here's my response to this. Here's why um, I would disagree with them, and you should too, and I'm right, and they're all wrong. <laughs> At least, I hope I'm right about that. I think I'm right. I'm, I'm convinced that this is the case. So let me share with you some reasons why. The reason, and, and, and you can miss this. This is easy to miss. Why do you know that in Mark 8, 12, 8, 38, 9, 19, why do you know that that's a contemporary generation? It's not because of the phrase, this generation. That's not how you know. And that's not why they use these, these verses to build that case. The reason you know those three passages I just read to you refer to Jesus' contemporary generation is because in the context of those passages, it has to be his contemporary generation. But there's a bit of a switcheroo being played with Mark 13 because Jesus says this generation and we're no longer using context to prove that he's talking about contemporaries. We're just making a rule about the words, this generation. And we're applying it to Mark 13. We didn't even do this in any of the other passages. This alone should tell you that Mark 13 is uniquely different than the other passages. Right? This is the rule for the other passages. Context tells you it's this generation. The rule for Mark 13 is um, these words have to mean that. But wait, what if, what if we just do the same thing we did in Mark 8 and Mark 9 and we let context tell us who Jesus is talking about? And I think this generation refers to the generation that sees the abomination of desolation, which Jesus says he doesn't know when it's going to happen. There's just going to be a big delay. Then there'll be a sign. And that generation, then the timing begins. The clock begins. The days will be cut short. So here, here's some of the reasons. Um, one, in Mark, in Luke, in Matthew, there are, there are indicators of a long delay between the first and second coming of Christ. Right? He talks about wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes. Like, how long does it take to have full-on wars, plural, and rumors of wars? Plural. 
it takes years and years and years. It's not like wars take a week long, typically speaking, especially back then. Years long. Wars would last years long. Just sieging one city could be years long. So this is a statement about delay. In addition to that, there's there's parables that follow Jesus's Olivet Discourse that speak of delay. The master delays his coming is the statement, right? So we read about in Mark, the man on a journey, or in Matthew, the parable of the ten virgins, the parable of the talents. These speak of a long delay. So we think there's going to be a long delay before this sign appears, the abomination of desolation. Another reason, Jesus doesn't know when this stuff's going to happen. It is a little inconsistent for Jesus to say, I don't know when it's going to happen, but it's within a generation. Why is that inconsistent? Because he knows so much about what happens at the very end of this stuff, right? The abomination of desolation. And he knows a lot of these events that are going to take place then. And he knows how long it is between one and the other. But he also says, I don't know when it's going to happen. What does he not know? He doesn't know when this whole sequence begins at the time. And we'll talk about that next week, about questions about the Trinity and all that kind of thing. So please hold your questions on that until then. Um, so yeah, I think that it makes sense contextually to say, well, this generation refers to the stuff he does know about, not the stuff he doesn't know about. He knows about this time clock that begins. I'm like pretending I have a stopwatch in my head. <laughs> the click, tick, 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 tick. That starts with the abomination of desolation. And it ends with the second coming. That's what he knows about. That's what happens within a generation. Also, he mentions in Mark 13, 20, Matthew 24, 22, that those days, that that time period where the, where the stopwatch is clicking, that is the time is cut short. That's the known time period. Um, this generation not passing is another way of saying that time is going to be cut short. So it contextually fits with what Jesus has already been talking about. In Matthew, in Mark, and in Luke, here's another reason. The phrase, this generation, is connected to events occurring at the end of the prophecy, not throughout it. Right? There's this, there's all these things. These are not signs. Then there's, boom, sign, da, da, da. And that's where the, this generation phrase comes. It comes at the very end, dealing with the, 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 the unknown future and um, how long it will last. In, in an, another case is this. In... Um, Luke, Mark, and Matthew, and you could look this up on your own, but in, in all three passages, Matthew uh, 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, the phrase, this generation, it's, it's followed by, um, in two of the gospels, the abomination of desolation and the cosmic signs. And in Luke, it's followed just by the cosmic signs. He doesn't mention the abomination in Luke. So this generation is connected to the cosmic signs, like grammatically, like it's the generation that sees those things. Whatever generation that is, that generation will not pass. Now I want to mention something called explanatory scope. If you guys haven't heard of this, this is a fun thing. Explanatory scope is the ability to explain lots of things with one explanation. Where one explanation ties together a whole bunch of loose ends. You know, if you find a crime scene and you see uh, a guy's fingerprints and you get DNA and then you have videotape footage and then you have like a weapon you find at that guy's house. A simple explanation is that one guy was at the crime scene and committed the murder, right? Because you have several pieces of evidence that are all explained by one theory. That's explanatory scope. What I'm suggesting is this generation, being whatever future generation sees the abomination of desolation, that has explanatory scope. It explains Jesus not knowing the day or the hour. It explains the idea of the time being cut short. It explains that the location of the this generation teaching is at the end, right after following those signs. It explains a number of things. I think it makes a lot of sense. Now, some would say, but Mike, I push back. In Mark, Jesus addresses the whole thing to people who were listening at the time, right? He says, when you see the abomination of desolation. So that means his, his audience has to see it. But I would raise you Mark 13, 37. <laughs> Here's Mark 13, 37. Um, I'm not gambling, I promise. But I would raise you Mark 13, 37, where Jesus says, uh, when I say to you, I say to all, be on the alert. The, the, the sense in which the early church understood that the teachings of Jesus were sometimes for all of the church and not just for the disciples hearing him, we have to recognize this when we read about especially a prophecy about an unknown distant future. When you see, you're the last generation. Who's the you? That remains to be seen. I think that's a, a fair way to, to understand the passage. Um, so yes, the majority of scholars would not agree with me on here, and I want to acknowledge that because it's true. But I also know this. I read every commentary I could find on Mark. I mean, a lot of commentaries on this passage. And 
in almost every single, pretty much every case that I could find, they don't even build a case for their view in a really robust way. I've done more work building the case for my view than every scholar that I read on the topic. They would just say, obviously, this is Jesus's contemporary generation. And if they did build a case at all, it was, the case is, you know, when Jesus is talking about this generation, it's always a contemporary generation. And I think that that's a little reckless. It ignores the fact that Mark 13, Matthew 24, Luke 21, these passages are uniquely different than everything Jesus said prior or later. Because here, he's speaking prophetically about the future. No one disagrees with that. Jesus is speaking prophetically about the future. So if anywhere, this generation means something different than the present generation, it's in the passage where he's teaching about the future. I'm right and they're all wrong. That's the bottom line. <laughs> and so I think that... Um, the progressive dispensational view, forgive me if I'm confusing anybody, I'm just going to throw this out there for those who know it, who've watched my six uh, different views of the end times video. The progressive dispensational view, it explains really well why you would see a partial connection to the first century, but not a complete connection. And that has good explanatory scope as well. Now, something really, really neat. And then I'm going to go to lessons we can learn and what I think maybe Calvary can be thinking about in the future and those who may have fall and pray to some of these same mistakes. Your, your life's not over. Your ministry's not over. It's just learn a lesson. This is the neat part. Um, Mark 13, 31, Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Okay, first off, he, he says this probably because it's like a sense of assurance. He knows his disciples will go through suffering and he wants them to be confident in the promises they've received about their glorious eternal future. This applies to our lives so much today. I was talking to someone recently about how... Hardship in their life caused them to become angry at God. And, um, and and in that moment of counseling, I didn't get into all those issues because sometimes you just listen, okay? But a lot of people go through those things and um, it was false expectation that life wouldn't be hard, that as a Christian, life wouldn't be difficult. Our expectation is we have a glorious eternal future, not that God will keep me from suffering in this life. Um, that's a sad reality, but it was never the promise that we wouldn't go through the suffering. And so he encourages them with these words, like you need to be confident and strong in the promises of Christ. His words will never pass away. But check this out. Jesus just did something that would be considered blasphemous if it wasn't Jesus who did it or if Jesus wasn't God. In the Old Testament, when the prophets talk about the word of the Lord, they don't call them their own words. The prophets like, thus says the Lord. And Jesus comes up and he says, thus says me right? My words will not pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Look at how Jesus himself even talks about the word of God. And notice that he's saying the same thing about himself. What's he saying about who he is and his words? Um, in Matthew five eighteen, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. All right, because what, what God says is going to happen, right? What God says is going to happen. Well, in Luke 16, 17, he says, it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of the letter of the law to fail. This is like a formula about what God has said is more stable and certain than the future of the universe. Right? This is, this is the, the certainty of God's word. Then we get back to Mark 13, 31, and Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Why? Because Jesus is speaking the words of God. Because Jesus is God with us. This is one of the subtle theological bombs that is laid in the Gospel of Mark for us to find as we read it carefully and thoughtfully. As we've discovered all along in our study of Mark, seeing these different moments of amazing just theological insights about the person of Christ that are steeped in understanding Old Testament and New Testament, this is one of them. And I think it's absolutely beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Now I want to apply this stuff. In times, speculations are problematic. They're exciting, but they can have a bad result. In the end, they can create embarrassment. That embarrassment can cause a lot of confusion and uncertainty in people because they've learned to trust you as a leader. And they think that you as a leader are very reliable. And you treated speculations as if they were as reliable as the certain, clear, obvious meaning of scripture. In this case, Many in Calvary's, including Pastor Chuck, who I love and still appreciate, still appreciate, and still would recommend his content to people. But when it comes to end time stuff, I would say, take it with a grain of salt. Why? 
because of the obvious issues that exist there. And I should be aware of those things. I don't want to cast doubt on prophecy or see people fall away because I overstated my speculations about end times. What Jesus said is going to happen. His words will never pass away. But if you start adding to his words, your words, they're going to pass away. And that's going to be a bad thing. So can you do it? Can you look at like um, the movements in the Islamic world and Europe and Russia and the things that are going on? And can you say like, I wonder if this could be leading to that? I'm okay with people doing that as long as they're honest about the limits of their speculations. Guys, I could be completely wrong here. We could be way further away from the coming of Christ than I'm speculating here. And if they're at least honest about it, that is integrity. We're given a clear sign we haven't seen and we should not treat everything else like they're clear signs. Can I offer some advice to non-leaders? If you're not a leader and you're a Christian and you love end time stuff, I just want to encourage you with this. I feel like I'm going to lose a lot of friends and subscribers today. Um, my encouragement is this. Do not reward the reckless. On the internet, there are whole ministries that are based upon reckless guesswork about prophecy. Now, I'm not opposed. Like I said, listen, I'm not opposed to someone saying, look, they might be building the temple. This is this fits biblical prophecy here and there. I have no problem with that. But when those people are not very careful and measured and thoughtful and they're reckless people, don't reward them by watching their content and sharing their content. Please, it, it will backfire in the end. It's exciting and then there's a backfire, right? exciting and then there's a backfire. It's like jumping off a cliff. It might feel good on the way down, but you're going to hit the ground at some point. Now, I still respect Pastor Chuck Smith, uh, the the emphasis on scripture, the emphasis um, on, on evangelism. And I, I mean, I really highly respect him and I don't dismiss him as a teacher or think he's ungodly or that he's not saved or something like this. No, I, I just don't respect how this issue has been handled in Calvary circles. I think it's been swept under the rug. And I think a lot of Calvary pastors aren't even aware of it. I don't think they're part of some conspiracy. I think they're literally unaware. I was unaware until you guys started sending me questions about it. And I realized everybody outside Calvary seems to know about the issues that Calvary seems to not talk about. We should probably deal with this stuff. We should probably deal with this stuff. Now, I want to mention real quick, though. There's plenty of people that got saved because of the overzealous eschatology um, speculations that were going on with <clears throat> whether it's how Lindsay's great, late great plan to earth or even pastor Chuck Smith, a lot of people got saved and like, that's not a bad thing, right? That's not a bad thing, but there's a blowback because there was a mixed, there, there was like some chaff in, in with the wheat there, right? There was some bones in with the meat of the gospel. But here's the upside of coming soon preaching. Telling people that Jesus is coming back soon and you know and you know it's going to happen within a few years, that's very exciting. It stirs and motivates your congregation. It gets them out there to spread the gospel. And my thought is this, we should be that serious even if we don't know when Jesus is coming back. Like you don't have to have the rapture happening within 10 years of now to be extremely zealous and going out there and preaching the gospel of Christ because you don't know the person you're talking to, they might not have tomorrow themselves. Their life is short. And you listening to this video, you might be like, well, so the rapture might be, or the tribulation or the, or the second coming might be, you know, a thousand years out. Like, what if it's a thousand years? I guess I can relax and do my own thing. I'll be like, well, that's the biggest lie in the world. You need to get your life right with Jesus Christ right now. If there's just one verse I want to share with you guys before we end, it's, it's this one from Isaiah. I love this passage. I hardly ever share it. And I, I should share it more. Isaiah 55, verse six and seven, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. God is calling you home right now to know Christ. And I don't know when Jesus is returning, but I also don't know when you, you're just going to leave this earth and your opportunity to know Christ has passed. Give your life and heart to Christ today. Please get serious. Salvation is an urgent issue. It's not something you just want to get right before you die. It's a present reality you need right in your life right now today. Repent and believe the gospel. Give your life to Christ. The best thing that ever came out of false end time speculations is zeal to get people saved because the end is nigh. Well, everyone's end is nigh. Everyone watching me right now, you've got one generation maximum. right? Because you're not going to be here 100 years from now. No, your decisions will have been made. And I... I, man, I just, I plead with you. 
Come to the Lord. Today's the day of his mercy. Today's the day of his grace and his kindness. Give your heart and life to Jesus Christ. Repent and believe. He will abundantly pardon. You don't think he'll forgive you? That's just another lie to do your own thing. Give your life to Christ. He will forgive you. All right, next week, we are going to be uh, talking about why Jesus didn't know the day or the hour. Why didn't Jesus know the day or the hour? And we'll deal with his, his common his comments on us on staying awake and i think we need this stuff so bad this stuff that's coming next week as we continue the mark series and then that'll be the end for the future prophecy stuff in the gospel of mark then we're going to move on to the crucifixion of christ i um i I hope i haven't lost any any good calvary friends (laughs) through this and if i've somehow made some errors or mistakes i'm open to being corrected here Um, but this stuff needs to be dealt with and to be honest uh, to my calvary leaders that have gone before me like i'm bummed that you haven't talked about this stuff more Um, It would have been nice to be better prepared, but now maybe we are. All right. Lord bless you guys.